The year is 2011, and I just got my first Xbox 360 with a copy of Black Ops 1. The beginning of my descent into online multiplayer shooters. Before then, I had an original Xbox, but alas, never connected it to the internet. So all I played was the offline content and games like Halo and Time Splitters 2 and 3. I'd play the stories, the multiplayer of the bots, and even spent countless hours on level creators if they had any. Oh, fuck! And I had lost an innumerable amount of my time with on-rail shooters. The entire House of the Dead franchise, Ghost Squad, and well, even Time Crisis 2 on the PS2. Shoot outside of the screen! I was, well, cultured, to say the least. I did play plenty of games outside of shooters from time to time, but it was clear that I had a knack for games with first-person mechanics with a comfortable bar of entry. So, when Call of Duty was my introduction into the same genre but with online multiplayer, I was lost. Hours became days, became months, and then suddenly half a decade passes, and you forget how to play games of any other genre, wait, what? Seriously, I'm not kidding when I say Call of Duty or shooters in general scrambled my perceptions of video games with the counter UAV jammer. See what I mean? My marriage with first person shooters handicapped my entry into other games of starkly different genres. Dragon Age? <laughs> What's with all these buttons? Where's the gun? Where's the Barrett 50 cow? For all I cared, when I booted up a game, I just wanted a gun to shoot with a bad guy to kill. Call of Duty, whilst being an over the top action game, doesn't really encourage the player to think, rather asking you to keep your arms and head inside the ride at all times. This is why I could understand the elements of a story in shooter games, because the way they were told were so brain numbingly simple, and that happens to be a problem if time to try other games with more complex narratives. You cannot even grasp the nature. That experience makes this concept so interesting to me, because a person's interest in media is rooted in their personal history. That said, I want to be explicit that any of the dumb shit that I talk about in this video is not scientifically backed. I'm purely speaking from the observations of my behavior towards media. Sources, I made it the fuck up. This is something I've been thinking about and wanted to get off my mind, and who knows, perhaps you may relate. So I invite you to comment your thoughts on the matter, to disagree, to call me mean names so I can show your comments to my friends to laugh at you, because your enjoyment of content I say is is one size fits you. So, Call of Duty did irreparable harm to my attention span. I do find shooters to be fun experiences, but my overall mentality towards video games as a result kept my thinking inside the box. It robbed me of the many untapped wondrous experiences hidden inside other mediums, trapping my mind in a pit of numbing linearity. Ooh, what does 2 plus 2 equal? Well, duh, Dr. Kawashima-san, it's gun. This is what happens to the card-minded Zoomer. I don't think like this anymore. I kind of hardly play shooters. Firstly, I'm not a dumb teenager, I'm a dumb adult, and I can just about look past the surface level of a narrative with the power of interpretation. Have you seen how people play shooters these days? Military bros, do you really do this? Tryharding every game became exhaustive and squeezed all the fun out of these games, leaving behind a dried up, shriveled carcass of enjoyment that had been min-maxed, suckled dry from the final remaining nipple. I'm not saying shooter games are bad, by the way. I I still play them every so often, and I do enjoy my time with them. The finals is a good example of what I've been enjoying recently, though it is worrying when I pull off a good play and think to myself, huh, I still got it. Don't worry, buddy. Arthritis is just around the corner. Bored of shooters, I turned to different measures, expanding my gamer horizons to the ambitious pastures, experimenting with different games of different genres that cater to a demographic who are either old as fuck, the 30-year-olds, or have crippling OCD. These games make me feel like a big boy, and eventually I'll age so far that I'll be playing professional solitaire, glass of wine in hand. I reckon that you'd be hard-pressed to find that I am, in fact, still stupid now. I didn't even spell arthritis correctly in this script. This makes me the type of gamer who will have a trough full of abilities ready at his disposal, and only use one throughout the entire game because I didn't feel like reading how the other ones work, but that's just an issue. A dyslexia skill issue. Ah, just doesn't roll as well. This is why I think gamers are a product of the games they play, just as much as we are all a product of Ryan Gosling. If you only play shooter games, that will be all you know how to play, and in my case, struggle to break into other genres. Either that, or I'm just at the risk of self-reporting my intelligence. Regardless, this is why modern game dev leans towards more casual gamers, to create a smoother barrier of entry. These simplifications of designs that evolved from a bygone era, I believe, are too commonly boiled down to simplification and leaving it at that. 
taking it for granted. I'll elaborate on this later, but for now, one byproduct of this casualization to create a wider accessibility is that this can affect newer audiences, expectations, and preconceptions of other games, both inside and out of their respective genre. Whilst you can still appreciate the contents, the difficulty of consuming it may vary depending on your experience. It's like the discussion about how TikTok is ruining the attention span of its users. It's simple and accessible content in abundance. And uh, oh, I have a test subject. Test subject number one, it's your turn. No, no, I don't want any back talk. I just want you to speak your piece. We had a desk and it had two stations on it. So we bought another controller and, and we got rid of the keyboard. So we had, we had controller and we had controller, right? Because they're smaller. The kids' hands can work on them. So kids walk up, 50%. Half of the children that came up moved the controller to the side, not knowing what it was, reached out and tried to touch the monitor because they had never played a game outside of on a phone or a tablet and thought it was a touch screen. Of course, a child's behavior towards games is not comparable to an adult's. It's exaggerated, but I'm using this clip in a way to suggest that games in a way are teachers of their medium. Put simply, the way your game teaches the player how to play it will affect the way your audience look at other games in the same genre. <laughs> I surrender. Sometimes in other genres with familiar systems. Or maybe this is all just me and I'm hardcore projecting and my struggle to enter other genres or older games is very much a me issue. Maybe some games and genres just aren't for me. Maybe I'm not ready for them at this present time. I like the idea of playing these games, but I don't understand why the fuck I just can't get into them. Anyway, despite my whinging of my intelligence, which I am only condemned to suffer, I wasn't always like this. You see, before 11 year old me can get his hands on contributing to gaming's biggest downfall, I used to play games that required me to think a bit more. I'll give you two examples, 007 Nightfire and Time Splitters 2. Firstly, Time Splitters 2. This baby can carry all the golden eye you could want. So the remake was robbed from us. Both GoldenEye and Time Splitters have a difficulty system where the harder you play, the more damage you take and the more tasks you have to complete. These tasks are found in a journal, being straightforward, leaving you alone to navigate and explore the environments to find your objective. So let's just get rid of this shit and use your fucking eyes, please. I don't have any, I can't see. This teaches the player to use that little noggin up there and to observe, to soak in the world. It's wet. And you have to because the objectives will hide in plain sight. Modern gaming would use these file cabinets as environmental fodder, but in Time Splitters 2, it's an objective that could go under your nose if you didn't pay attention. There's no golden shimmer to tell you that it's important, the journal already did that. However, the map sizes do vary. There are times in games like GoldenEye, I would get lost in the map, confused of where to go and what to do. So I understand why in the modern day, waypoint markers are a thing. They do have their place, but at times, I feel like it's a last minute remedy for the bad communication with the player sickness. Elden Ring, Alan Wake 2, literally any Silent Hill game are a good example of level design done right. Hell, even Outer Wilds, which I've been playing recently and oh my god, play Outer Wilds. These games would feed you just enough information on the world that is simple to follow. Here's your goal, here's a map, go do the thing you have to do. Though, if you wanted to do anything besides the main story in Elden Ring, I do have a wiki prepared. Me and Waypoints, our relationship, it's... It's, it's complicated, okay? Babe, shut up, we'll talk about it another time. Time Splitters 2's setting of time travel aids the gameplay loop of solving your objective with set pieces relative to the time period. This keeps the game visually interesting, all the while introducing new enemies, weapons, music, sometimes even forcing you to rethink how to interact with the environment. The fact I can understand what to do in this game from an age where I couldn't even count is a marker of how good the design was. As skilled as Time Splitters is with communicating the player the objectives through the world, I think it is held back by its linear methods to complete them. I remember playing this with Pyrocynical and it was fun, but eventually we got to Neo Tokyo. This iconic level is showered in ambience. <laughs> Get it? Cause rain. Flying police cars roam the air. Neon signs illuminate the streets like a sun. In this level, you have to stealthily tail someone into their epic hacker compound, where afterwards you steal the crypto and escape. It's pretty simple. However, the AI must have took 10 fish oil pills that day because they have giga vision. They could spot you through the walls, and if they do, the mission is a bust and you have to restart. Modern video games oftentimes fall victim to the poor design choices of their predecessors, failing to understand why a sequence isn't favorable for the game. In in the H Bomber Guy video about New Vegas, he mentioned 
mentions that Bethesda failed twice with Fallout 3 and 4 to realize that unskippable intro tutorials are unwanted. They had the opportunity to learn from Fallout 2's mistake of that inclusion, yet they neglected it. It's one of the few things most people don't like about 2, and players often use mods to skip it entirely. Can you imagine having like a decade of hindsight on all the criticisms people had of Fallout 2, and then making a game where the opening is like three times as long? That would be a bit silly, wouldn't it? Uh, I'm sure they'll learn the lesson for Fallout 4. <laughs> Side note too, the Fallout 2 devs were forced to include this tutorial introduction, and it was essential that it was unskippable. At the Temple of Trials at the beginning of Fallout 2, we were mandated to put that in. We were told there had to be a tutorial. I said, can people skip it? No. What about on subsequent playthroughs? No. Regardless, I think intro tutorials and tailing missions on a surface level are fine, but do you know what's even better? Player agency! Let the player have control and do the fun thing. Let them skip that intro tutorial. And tailing missions, ooh, don't think you're getting away easy. If your tailing mission is on a set path and requires me to wait with no other options, you are wasting my time. This is not playing, it is waiting in the DMV line. I, the player, has no input in the sequence. I am quite literally waiting for the game to play itself. This removes tension because it's predictable and boring. At least give me a failsafe, anything like a back entrance that's flooded with enemies. Any plan B would have been good. To balance this idea, Reward me with easy access for successfully tailing, but punish my failures by giving me a harder task to enter this compound. The reason tailing or stealth mechanics work in games like Metal Gear Solid is that they provide you with a variety of tools with multiple uses for different environments that you, the player, have to observe and adapt to. Better yet, Kojima-san lets you live with your mistakes. Luckily, there is a game that achieves some of Time Splitters 2 mechanics better, and that was... Zero Zero Seven Nightfire is better than GoldenEye 64, and it's completely criminal that it isn't talked about enough. By the way, there are two versions of this game, a console version and a PC version. And actually, 007 Nightfire on the PC is gearbox slop created straight from the piss on Randy Pitchford's USB drive. It is rare that a console version of a game is better than the PC, but here they were. Nightfire is everything Time Splitters 2 does right, but it provides multiple routes to navigate your objective and provides different tools and means to accomplish them. Better yet, if you're caught during your espionage, you aren't forced to restart. You are made to live with your mistakes, you cretin. Levels can be and are harder to navigate if you are spotted, which makes that feeling of gracefully sneaking by much more rewarding. Plus, you're given a taser, which is fun. There is much topic and debate about games that handhold and how egregious it may or may not be. I, for one, am in the anti-waypoint army because they are just antithetical to using intuition. But how players are directed relies so much on the core designs of games and how they telegraph those features. Gameplay mechanics and its tools, the level designs and how the tools can be used in there, and how does the environment indicate the player and what to do and where to go. <laughs> Here's a simple example of game design. In front of you, there are five doors that lead to a room. One of these doors leads you to the correct route. So how do we indicate to the player the correct route without being obvious? Simple, if you put a staircase and a Capra demon inside the wrong doors, it is such a strange feeling to live in an era where open world game design is heavily influenced by the likes of the Ubisoft formula. It's tried and true. It works, it has a wide audience. However, the ocean is wide, yet it is shallow. That ocean being full of to-do lists, a grocery shopping experience tailing you down lane after lane until you reach the checkout. Out, where additionally, if you're feeling a little peckish, you can grab the small little Hershey's DLC. This is a formula I would argue a majority of gamers are familiar with and are mentally tuned into. It makes going back and playing games like Morrowind strange. To successfully navigate using wooden signs to know what town and what road you're on is an unusually rewarding experience for such a standard method of traversal. It's tedious, yet rewarding. It makes the to-do list formula especially more strange since this old school road sign method was just normal back then. Back in my day, I followed an X on a piece of paper with only an I. What? What? What is that? You know, that is getting awfully larger. Games have been simplified for the sake of accessibility. And I mean simplification in the broadest of terms because game design is too nuanced to claim everything is simple. When I say simplified, I mean a Fortnite kid today would struggle to play something like System Shock 2 and will have an epileptic fit at the sight of System Shock 1. That said, I'm not going to catastrophize about how it's ruining the industry because it's not. A game can have simple gameplay, but have a complex layer around it. Puzzle games are a good example of this. Typically, a good puzzle game will allow the player to toy and tinker with their surroundings to accumulate a better understanding of the rules that have been laid out in front of them, to varying levels of difficulty. Portal, The Witness, The Return of Oberdin, all have simple mechanics paired with complex problems and solutions. So much so, they really force you to rethink what you may already assume about the mechanics or level designs. This is the archetypical genre that engages player intuition. There is no greater feeling of a high when you're stuck in a puzzle for a few minutes, breaking every possible solution down, that when you finally hit that orgasmic moment, the brain clicks and you utter the word 
words. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have been on a Tim Kaine binge recently. He's been posting videos to YouTube about his history and experience in game dev. This includes his thoughts and process you go through to make a game. You may know him as one of the people who created the original Fallout. In his video, How to Make a Good Game Setting, he brings up that if from the start of a development cycle, your aim is to capture casual audiences, it changes how the game is made. One of the things I was told at the very beginning was, we want casual players, casual RPG players, to want to play this. This changes things. It changes what you put in the game. Then goes on to discuss the dumbing down claims on the industry. A lot of people spin that as, oh, you dumbed that, you dumbed everything down. No, you can have things that are just as complex, whether it's the story or the setting or the mechanics. You just have to kind of lower the slope. A lot of games used to have a higher and more difficult level of entry. Having overwhelming systems thrown at you from the start of the game can be a big chew that's hard to swallow. When you make this hurdle smaller and more digestible, you can cast wider metaphorical nets to capture wider metaphorical audiences. Well, unless you're from software. It's a shame with older titles though. Those games are harder and do filter a lot of new players. Though, when you do overcome these hurdles, you can discover an amazing game behind the difficulty curve that blocks the view. The gaming industry throughout its years of evolution has figured out how to introduce its mechanics at an accessible level, while catering towards hardcore players to reach a more advanced skill ceiling. What the fuck was that? Games like System Shock 1, Morrowind will give first time players, and even more so players who come from the Skyrim era, a tougher time to settle into the game. While these games are great, let's admit to ourselves that the expiration dates on these games have expired way before half of you were even born. They don't do a great job at explaining how their game works, and it even poor a job to create a smooth incline for the learning curve. Exhibition 1. Ah, it's the infinite jest of game instructions. And in Morrowind's case, sometimes the game isn't explicit about what you should do, so a waypoint marker would be really helpful right now. Oh my god, please take me back, I promise I'll be good. Can we just come to terms that using a Wikipedia is fine when a game poorly explains themselves? After all, your enjoyment of a game is limited by your tastes. What? Who cares what others say what is the correct way to play? Go ahead and use that Bible of Terraria. Use that soapstone to beat that boss. Use those cooldown removal mods on your Mass Effect Insanity run. Because if you're enjoying it, who cares? If you wanted to go back and play older titles that have a higher skill of entry, I have a suggestion for you. I'd advise that you build some gaming calluses with successes of the genre you want to get into. Want to get into immersive sims? Play Prey or Dishonored. Want to get into isometric tabletop RPGs? Play Baldur's Door 3. Want to get into mechanical engineering? Play War Thunder. Find something that succeeds an older game of that genre. Get familiar with that and work your way backwards. Except send you back to the people in a body bag. Baldur's Gate 3 is what introduced me into its genre. Now, I feel comfortable enough to go back and play games like Fallout 1 and 2, without being scared by the lack of first-person mechanics. At the root of it all, this is what suits my fit. Video games, books, and movies do not have an objective enjoyment meter. You can enjoy what is widely viewed as a flawed piece of content, as much as one that is heralded as a masterpiece. Your enjoyment of a game is not one-size-fits-all, because it exclusively fits you. If you prefer Far Cry 6 over Far Cry 2, it's okay. I'll only secretly judge you.